You all look beautiful today. You really do. You really do. It is good to be together. And I thank you for your presence here. I thank those who are joining us on live stream and Facebook for your presence here. A few things. I'd like to say a special thanks to all those who were able to make a contribution for the flowers or the special music today. Um, it shows, and the sound is glorious. So thank you to the timpani, the brass, Josh, the choir, for a spectacular presentation and all of the music of Easter. I want to share something with you today. Um, you will see me wearing a mask most of the service today, and I want you to know I do that for my wife. Um, she has many different immune compromises, and she's asked me to do that, and I want to honor her in that. But I also do it for all of you, particularly those who face very similar kinds of things. So I will be wearing my mask, and there it is. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank um, my colleagues, our members and friends, who have added so much to the Forgiveness Sermon Series, Reverend Joanna Samuelson, Reverend Amanda Connolly, Reverend John Ashbery, Reverend Sarah Reed, all who were at Sunrise today, and Reverend Larry Miller uh, for your magnificent and powerful preaching during this season. Thank you. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Her name was Mary. She came from a small fishing town named Magdala. So sometimes you'll hear her called Mary of Magdala or Mary Magdalene, sometimes just Magdalene or Madeline. But Mary was a follower of Jesus. She was one who listened to him, learned from him, understood him as she studied at his feet. She stood by him. Mary was, in my belief, the top apostle. She was an apostle to the apostles as her ministry continued to unfold following the ascension of Jesus. Mary always showed up. She was a true rock in the gospel story. Since Jesus had come into her life, Mary was healed, forgiven and transformed. And through his ministry, throughout the whole ministry, she was there. She was there when he taught. She was there when he arrest, was arrested and was falsely tried. She was there. She was there when he carried the cross through the streets of Jerusalem. And she was there when the cross was planted and he was upon it for his crucifixion. She was at the foot of the cross. She was there. She always showed up. And on this day of resurrection, John's Gospel tells us that Mary shows up once again. She goes to the garden tomb alone, intending to care for the corpse of her friend, her rabbi. What she finds is altogether different. It's a different matter that she encounters once she arrives. She arrives and finds that the huge stone in front of the tomb is gone. It's been rolled away. Without hesitation, without looking in, she runs and tells Peter and John what's happened. They run, they find the empty tomb as Joanna was just reading. They say nothing to each other, they simply return to their homes. And then Mary comes back, she is there once again, standing there, weeping outside the tomb. In time, she looks into the tomb and she sees two angels, neither of which were seen by Peter and John apparently. The angels are seated where Jesus' head had been and where his feet had been laid. And she asks the angels where he is. She doesn't get much of an answer. And what's really interesting here is, for those of us who know the angels in scriptures, they're always talking. So the silence sort of astounds us. But she's overwhelmed. She's weeping hysterically. And she turns and she steps out and she looks at the risen Christ. He's there right in front of him, her, and she does not know him. She can't see him. She speaks to him as though he were the gardener, and she asks him to show her where Jesus' body is. She means business. And he speaks to her and says her name, Mary. 
Now she recognizes him. She cries out, Rabboni, teacher. After a few more words, he ascends to God, and she runs and tells the story. I have seen the Lord, she says. It, it is through her tears that Mary witnesses the impossible becoming real. Jesus Christ is risen. He is alive again. There will be 11 more appearances of the risen Christ across the four Gospels uh, in the days ahead, in the days and weeks to come. He appears to as few as two and as many as 500. As he ascends finally to God, all of this is happening in our presence. But Mary is the first witness of the resurrection. Now, as you know, in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, other women are there. I want you to know a pattern. Women, Matthew, Mark, Luke, including Mary, woman in John, no men. That's another sermon, and I know you want to hear it, and I got it in me. It's about to start, but I'm... <laughs> the evidence supports the truth. Mary is the best apostle of Jesus in the Gospels. She is loyal, she is present, She's a student, she learns, she listens, she follows, she's supportive, she's consistently growing and evolving as a person of faith, and she never gives up on Jesus and his vision and his teachings and his healings and his miracles. He is her rabbi, her rabboni. But then, thanks to another Easter sermon delivered by Pope Gregory I in 591, a twisted, misogynistic, judgmental version of St. Mary Magdalene appears. He calls her a prostitute on Easter morning. He said she was a prostitute saved by Jesus. He conflates several stories into one, pulling from all these things like a magician pulling from a hat, and he throws shade on St. Mary Magdalene. Now, I don't know how many sermons you've heard or how many times you've heard. I've been in Bible studies. I've been in many studies where everybody refers to Mary as the redeemed prostitute. No, she wasn't. Mary Magdalene was not a prostitute. She was a magnificent woman of God who followed Jesus to the end and then in his resurrection continued to follow. That's who she was. Not, that, not only is this twisted narrative about her wrong, it damages her place in the Gospels for the next 1,400 years. Because Pope Gregory I was seen as a great scholar, a doctor of the church, he was sainted himself for his wisdom. His words became a new gospel of truth. Anyone who drank Gregory's sixth century Kool-Aid was given the freedom to run with this new narrative the narrative unleashed fictional characterizations about Mary which declared her Jesus' wife and more. You've seen the movies, you've heard the stories. And for centuries, anyone who questioned the new narrative was questioned themselves. For women then, and for women through all the generations, words like prostitute or wayward woman get tossed around lightly by men and they damage people and they hurt them to the core and the pain is devastating. Women are not only denigrated with such hatefulness, they're also marginalized and seen as invisible by others, so much so that men feel like they can make rules, they can pass laws, they can even pronounce judgments from on high, we'll call it like the Supreme Court, and diminish women in lots of other ways and tell women how they should control their bodies, or tell the women how the men should take care of that, and tell women what they will do with their life, and tell women what the sanctity of life means. Do you see how this works? It begins when somebody makes something up about somebody else, and rumors and lies and half-truths spread as a new false conflative narrative place, replacing the truth. It happened to Jesus. It happened to Mary. If people can get away with it with Jesus and Mary, they can get away with it with anybody, anywhere, anytime. It may have happened to you, or someone you know and love. Now others have lied about them and placed denigrating labels on them or spread 
wounds, spread words that wounded them deeply. It can happen to anyone. The lies that are spread in one generation may take generations to repair, literally, like you've seen here. Beyond individuals and women, this has happened to whole tribes, whole nations, whole ethnic groups, whole religious groups of people. It has happened to African Americans in this country as they were enslaved. And the narrative created by white folks was that they were happy. What? No, slaves were not happy. They may have been individually happy human beings, but they were treated like dirt. That doesn't make anyone happy. Nevertheless, and God is always in the nevertheless, people rise. They overcome twisted narratives. They set stories straight. It happened for Jesus as he rose from the grave. All the lies that had been said about him just days before, poof, he's the risen one now. It happened for Mary Magdalene too. In recent years, there have been new popes, new scholars, new people of faith who have risen to reclaim St. Mary Magdalene and restore her to her rightful place. Thanks be to God for Mary Magdalene and all who have fought to restore her to her rightful place and her powerful place in the Easter narrative, the first witness of the resurrection. Top apostle, top saint. You know what? I think it might be closed Monday, but I'm gonna call on Tuesday to the Vatican. I have an idea. I think Pope Francis can really set the record straight. I think he should rename the Vatican Basilica St. Mary Magdalene Basilica. I like that. Or at least St. Mary Magdalene and St. Peter's Basilica. I'm just saying that could help. But then on Wednesday, he could announce that women will be ordained in the Catholic Church as priests. And soon there'll be bishops and cardinals, and I'm saying maybe popes. I mean, we've been doing it for 170 years in our church. Why can't they start now? It's time for Rome to catch up. So those are two calls, Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay. As we embrace Mary Magdalene in all her grace and love, we ask God also to forgive Gregory for his transgressions delivered on Easter Sunday, 1432 years ago. Speaking of St. Peter, who we were mentioning, we're not done yet. Acts 10, 34 to 43 that Alex read so beautifully is calling us to deal with Peter this morning as well. Peter, who abandoned Jesus, who denied he even knew him, who left him to die on a cross and hid somewhere during the whole ordeal. Peter, who shows up at the cross, or shows up at the empty grave this morning and then runs back home. This same Peter changes dramatically. He changes amazingly. Sometime after Christ's ascension, Peter is in the story with Cornelius, the Roman centurion, and makes a faith proclamation about baptizing Cornelius and his household, his wife and his children. The translation from the message, Eugene Peterson's words say this, now I get it, Peter says. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and you're ready to do as he says, the doors open. Some of us, like our beloved Peter, are slow learners. It takes some of us a long time to see our sins and our failings and admit them. But we can count on God, who never gives up on us in all the time we're taking, because God does what God has always done. God loves a repentant sinner he loves a repentant sinner back into the fullness of grace and into the community of forgiveness. When Peter finally gets it right, his words radically transform the world. God shows no partiality. God plays no favorites. Simply translated, God loves and accepts each and every one of us. It doesn't matter to God where you're from. It doesn't matter to God what you're carrying. It doesn't matter to God what someone said about you or even what you say about yourself, good or bad. God wants to be in relationship with you and love you. God wants you. If you want God, as Peter says, the door's open. So whether you are Mary Magdalene on the scene, servant of the Lord, 2,000 years later having to reclaim your rightful place as the first witness in the story, 
or whether you're Peter, who's fallen by the wayside, hidden when he needed to be standing tall, and you rise to new life yourself out of denial and abandonment, there is redemption and forgiveness. There is healing in forgiveness. There is hope in forgiveness. You see, forgiveness is at the heart of everything, all the time, everywhere. Resurrection faith is all about forgiveness. It's about redemption. We have spent the last 46 days and nights focused on forgiveness, and here we are on Easter with forgiveness, embracing resurrection face to face. The heart of our Christianity is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the greatest and the hardest work that any of us will do in our lifetime. In daily working toward forgiveness, remember Dietrich Bonhoeffer's words, Christianity is forgiveness. Christianity is forgiveness, nothing more, nothing less. And each of us has room to grow into the fullness of forgiveness. But on this day of resurrection, when we proclaim that God raises God's son from death to new life, we must believe that if God will do this for Jesus, God will do it for us. God will raise each of us to a new life, forgiven and redeemed. And no matter what happens, and no matter how it happens, forgiveness is crying to us and wants us to move forward to a new day. So let go. Let God, in the power of the Holy Spirit and embracing love in the risen Christ, let's all move forward. Amen.